Yeah, um, thank you for letting me follow that uh, trio of uh, Marcus, uh, Jesus, and Asher. This would be a more sedate affair, I think. Um, yeah, so I am uh, one of the newer members uh, at, uh, here at Dialog. Um, some of you may recognize me. I've written a bit about APL. Um, I've talked uh, at a couple of these conferences before as well. Um, but this is my first go as a, as a proper uh, dialoguer. You know. Um, yeah, so, so here at Dialogue, um, what I do, um, it's still an open question, I think, that, but I, I'm, I'm here to champion the Mac and, and, and ride, um, which incidentally is a bit of a lonely pursuit, um, I grant you, but I'm also here as perhaps representing the view of the software engineer, uh, the computer person. Uh, computer scientists coming to, to Dialogue APL without decades of previous experience. I mean, we can't all be subject matter experts. Uh, some of us just like to write code. Um, I also dock my windows um, to, to Morton's uh, despair. Um, but before I joined Dialogue, I, I worked for many years at IBM, uh, working on a, a serverless NoSQL database called Cloudant. Um, I might actually return to that briefly as an as a sort of illustration uh, of this a bit. But I'm here to talk today about Kafka, uh, and that's Apache Kafka, not Franz Kafka, the author. Um, so, but before I get into that, I'd just like to sort of give a little bit of disclaimer here that, that this talk isn't really about APL that much. Um, I'm going to talk about a third-party sprawling uh, system written in Java that you either have never heard of, or even if you have heard of it, you might not care so much about. Um, but if you are in a situation that, you, that you're looking to build a, a sort of uh, microservices distributed application in the cloud, and we've seen some, some examples of that already in a couple of days here, you might just find this, this, this interesting. Um, and if you don't, uh, I won't be offended if you decide to sneak out. Um, so what's this Kafka thing then? Um, clearly, it's an absolutely terrible name for a product. It gives no clue what it is or what it does, what it's for. And as APLers, yeah, what, what was got to, you know, to paraphrase Tina Turner perhaps here, yeah, like why, why should we even care about this? And, and I'm going to park that question for now. We sort of get over the, the, the sort of discussion of what it is, and then we'll return to why we should care about it. Yeah. Um, but if you look on, on Wikipedia, you get something like this back. Uh, it's a distributed event store, Steam pro stream processing platform, high throughput, low latency. That, um, and that's a great and correct description, but it doesn't really convey so much actually what it is, I think, anyway, not, 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 not very snappy. Um, and Kafka is sometimes labeled like a message queue, and, and, and that's kind of selling it short a little bit. Yeah, it, it can do a lot more even if you can still implement most sort of traditional enterprise queuing patterns and stuff on top of Kafka, if you, if you wish. But, but more accurately, perhaps, it's a distributed data streaming platform. And it's, it's a smart one. Uh, it's it's uh, distributed, uh, scalable, durable. You can replicate it. That's all good things here. But specifically, it implements the publish-subscribe pattern, the pub-sub stuff. and, and um, Brian mentioned it earlier as well. Um, but this really matters because what it means is that, that producers and consumers of data can operate completely asynchronously, completely decoupled. Um, so what would you use one of these things for? Well, maybe you're building out an application that looks something like this. Yeah, yeah, you have lot, lots of different components that, that talk to, to each other through some convoluted set of connections. Um, and this is really like Kafka home turf. Um, and Kafka can be used to ensure like an orderly flow uh, of data through, through, through an architecture of this type. Yeah. And it's got this nice property that it will buffer messages uh, that, that flow through the system for a set period of time, regardless of whether they've been sort of seen or not. Um, and in this diagram here that I stole from the Kafka book, um, the information or data flows from the top and, and, and down. And, and, and you can take from, from, the, from the bottom here, like you can take any of these boxes out um, for a bit. Yeah. Say that, that your database monitor, um, that there's been some uh, 
that there's a need to up, up, upgrade the software on it, perhaps. Yeah, you can you can take that out. You can you can you can update the software to you know remove some vulnerability. And once you sort of plug it back in, everything should just sort of catch up. Yeah? And, and that's a that's a very nice feature to have in a, this kind of application operationally. Like if you have to manage this thing. Yeah? So why should we care then? And, and the the answer, of course, is kind of in the clouds. Uh, um, and today, many applications are kind of built up like Lego. Right? Like, like you hook up ready-made components that's provided by your your cloud services provider. Yeah. And in the, these sort of uh, scenarios, you know, Kafka forms a very natural data backbone. Um, and I believe, and I think you hopefully believe too, that that, that dialogue has a role to play in, in these sort of applica applications. Yeah. Um, APL isn't an island. Yeah. We, we, in order to, 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 to do our work, we, we, we need to talk to other systems. Yeah. We need to be able to implement protocols. We need to talk to, I don't know, databases or, or, or whatever it might be. And <laughs> if we can make dialogue talk to Kafka, that will really open up some, some sort of opportunities to integrate APL solutions in, in these sort of cloud-based data pipelines. Um, when I was at Cloudant in my previous gig, um, one of the things we did was to write a, a, a sort of Kafka connector, as it's called, yeah? You implement a, a source and a sync. Uh, and that meant that people who needed access to, either to write or, or, or to read data that was stored in one of these cloud databases, um, they could do so by just hooking up to so they, they, this Kafka channel um, topic. Um, and they didn't really then need to know the ins and outs of the, the API uh, for, for Cloud itself. Uh, they could sort of hook us up like a, like a Lego brick. But before we before I go any deeper in this, yeah, just, just sort of let, get some terminolo terminology sorted. Yeah? So, so Kafka is a database-like thing. Um, there's some, some important differences, but, but at the bottom that we have the concept of the message, which is the fundamental sort of unit of data. And we can sort of think about that as a sort of like a row in, in a table in a relation database uh, in the, as, an, as an, an analogy. But a message cons consists of a, a message is sort of a key value pair, but the, the, the key doesn't uniquely identify the message. It, it identifies a sort of logical stream that, that this message belongs to. It, it's to do with the partitioning of, of this data set. And then we have topics. I mentioned it briefly earlier. And, and a topic is a named stream of data. Yeah? And it's sort of analogous to a table. Um, and these topics, they route messages from producers to consumers. And a producer and consumer then, <coughs> it's a little bit of a misnomer, I think. It was, it's easy to mis misunderstand. But consuming something kind of implies that it disappears, but it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's much more like reading uh, a row from a table uh, in database. You read it, uh, and then you perhaps go on to read the next one, but it's still there, so someone else can, can also read it if, if they need to. It doesn't delete it. And then we have the sort of fundamental unit of parallelism um, in, in Kafka, which is sort of the key to its um, scale-out capabilities. It's called a partition, and it's a logical a logical stream that, that's based on some property of, of, of this, these messages. Yeah. Usually it's the, the key that you can specify, or if you don't specify a key, Kafka will sort of round robin it for you. But, but it allows you to create these log, log, logical streams of data that can then be pushed out to different physical um, parts of, of, the, of the cluster, which is why we sort of kind of scale it out and access these things in parallel. And then we have the concept of the retention, and this is an important difference between Kafka and a proper database. Um, so Kafka is, I like to think of it as an operational data store, not a, a sort of a system, a record. It's not a place where you store things um, forever, yeah, because Kafka will hold on to messages for, for a while, and, and, and it can be a considerable while, but it's ultimately limited. Um, so you can say that, that I'm going to store things for 10 minutes or a week or, or wherever it might be. Yeah. Well, Kafka does support substantial retention time that, that's ultimately um, limited by your wallet. But, um, but this is actually a very useful uh, property to have. Now, what you can do is, like, like if, if you have an audit or you have a problem that, 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 that's appeared, you can play these things back. You can go back in time 
uh, provided that you're still within the retention time, and you can sort of replay events as, uh, in the order that they came in. And that's very, very helpful to, to, to uh, look for problems when they occur. But crucially, um, Kafka guarantees that all messages that are sent to a particular topic partition will be processed in order. And producers can then can set these partition keys and messages to create these logical streams here. Yeah, perhaps, you know, it's, it's all, in a, in maybe you have an IoT scenario, so all uh, messages that belong to a particular device will share a key and, and create a logical stream, or it could be a, uh, messages um, pertaining to the same customer or the same um, patient or client or whatever it might be. Um, all these messages then will, will end up on the same partition and can then be processed in order by, by a consumer group. Um, I came across, it's a bit hard to say, but I came across this um, blog post when I'm preparing this talk that someone compared Kafka to a game called Factorio. Um, and there sure are some touch points. Um, and Factorio is a sort of simulation, factory simulation or something like that. And, and you can build out quite complicated patterns uh, you can see on the top there there's a train coming in and it's got some raw materials and then there's like a consumer group of four things that pick pick things off and then passing it on to a producer that then makes something from from these materials and, and put it on a on a sort of partition partition topic so factory is a is a is a great game but if you if you value your spare time might, might give it a miss um, so let's talk a bit about how you run this thing um you can run Kafka locally fairly easily for develop development purposes uh, using Docker. Uh, obviously, starting a little Docker container on your laptop is not much of a uh, cluster, but you can certainly develop, test, and experiment with, with Kafka, which is what I've done here in this example. I just started it. So I started my Docker com com containers, and then I run a, a command to create uh, a particular topic called dialogue uh, with a single partition, et etc. But running a Kafka cluster is a non-trivial task if you want it to be an industrial strength. And all the big cloud providers uh, like Amazon and um, Microsoft and stuff, that they, they will usually run, uh, uh, they will have a, a managed Kafka offering that, that you can pay for. Uh, when I was at IBM, yeah, we had one, uh, and our Kafka offering was called Event Streams. They usually white label these things. Um, but Confluent, um, these guys, they're, they're sort of the main commercial backer for, for, for Kafka itself. They will spin up and manage Kafka as a service for you in a cloud provider of your choice. Yeah. And this is here's one I, I made earlier. This one ended up in the Las Vegas data center for Google Cloud, I think, um, when I did this. Uh, my credits have now expired, sadly. But, um, but it, unless you have very good reasons to run it yourself in, in, in a sort of production environment, you. Uh, it might be good to, to, to use a commercially managed Kafka as a service. But we're really here to talk about how you can get dialogue and, and Kafka to, to sort of coexist, talk to each other. Um, so how would we do that? Well, we have a few options. We could make our own uh, from scratch. Um, and ultimately, it's a protocol over TCP IP. So, you know, it can be done. There are a few libraries that do this, like... Um, the node library does this, implements the, 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 the protocol from scratch. It didn't really appeal to me, for, feel like a big risky job for very, relatively little gain, and, and, and we'd be on the hook then to track future changes to this protocol and, and, and um, keep it up to date. So th this, this didn't really have much appeal. Um, the Confluent that I just mentioned, um, they provide like reference grade libraries um, in, in a wide range of, uh, of languages. And all but their Java client, they wrap this C++ library, lib, rd, Kafka. It's kind of become the de facto standard for, for uh, talking to Kafka. And we could do that. Yeah, but we, have, we have ways of um, talking to, uh, calling into libraries written in C, like Congo does that, for example. So we could certainly do that. Or we could use the c -sharp library, confluent.kafka, and it's available on NuGet, which is the .NET package manager. And Dialog obviously has a handy .NET bridge to talk to c -sharp libraries directly. So guess which one I chose. Uh, um, so c -sharp was kind of ideally placed for this. Uh, it's the easiest solution to get, get this off the ground. The hard work is done. 
It's a very sort of fully fleshed out library, and also it's a very performant. Uh, it still wraps this, this, this native library. But it does have some disadvantages too. Um, there's no AIX support for .NET, so, and, and, and AIX is um, one of Dialog's supported platforms. Um, and it also uses some modern um, aspects of C-sharp for some definition of modern, um, like generics. Um, and that means that we can't quite express that directly in, in Dialog um, without jumping through some hoops. Um, although um, I've talked to John about this, uh, and I can see that he's on right after me here. Um, he might have something to say about this. Watch that space. Um, so generics then, what is it and what's the, the problem? Here's a little, see I came to dialogue to write APL. And I um, so this is a little sort of fragment of me using the, this Confluent.Kafka library in C Sharp, and we can see these, these generic things here. It's basically, you have to specify a, a particular signature for, for, for classes and, and, and data types. Uh, using uh, this this thing called, called generics, and we can't express this in dialog APL code um, directly. Um, and this is where where where, where I sort of sort of ended up with in 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 my APL code is to feed in this magic number type selector, which uh, like if if this type is zero, I choose this concrete type, which is a string producer. And then if it's not zero, I, I, it's, it's a sort of more generic uh, producer. And then these things, and I have to sort of create up front. And, and this is an example of this is the, the, the generic one. Um, I mean, this is still a fragment, but it's basically the whole thing. Uh, in fact, but you can see here, I've, I've had to sort of settle for a particular uh, signature. Yeah. Um, but there's no business logic here. There's no logic at all. In fact, you know, all, all it's doing is just concretizing these types and wrap them up in a, in a, in a, in a uh, class that we can then use, for, use from dialog. And, um, so we have a, a strategy then. We can write these thin C sharp classes that instantiate a set message signature. And I made two of these. Yeah, both of them use string keys. One of them as a string payload, and the other one as, as this generic byte array as a, as a payload. But, but this is then what, what it would look like in, in, in inside Dialog. Yeah. So I, I just sort of link in my my code, and I create a producer, and I feed in this. It's somewhat ugly but effective type selector, and this this zero means string, and I'm producing two messages that are both strings and have string keys onto the topic called Dialog. Um, but of course, the whole pitch here is, is that we should be able to um, talk to anything, like, like if we can talk to Kafka. So, so, so this is now outside dialogue. I want to be able to sort of pick, pick these things up that I just produced. Um, and here I'm using the most excellent tool called KCAT, uh, which is a, um, a command line Swiss Army chainsaw for 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 for, uh, uh, for Kafka and, and it actually wraps this this uh, uh, libRD Kafka uh, library that, that sees so it, that's very fast and they can do everything that that, that library can do um, so in this in this instance what I'm doing is I'm I'm setting KCAT in consumer mode so to read I'm pointing it at the uh, the, the dialogue topic which I just showed in the previous slide and I'm pointing it to my local Kafka and you can see that. Even though this is just a screenshot, but you see that those two messages came through, and then we get a message at the end saying, "Like I've reached the end of this topic." And so scroll to the uh, to the end. If you do anything with Kafka, you know, do install this KCAT thing. is is a very useful uh, testing uh, testing tool. But it's easy to show screenshots, right? Um, so let's see if I can do this live. So I got. Um, Little dialogue uh, session there. Is that a good size? Can people see that? Give or take. And here's a sh just a shell. Uh, uh, I'm going to start this, this this demo, and this is a demo that's packaged as a Jupyter notebook. Uh, thanks to Adam, wrote this for me uh, to be able to do this. Um, so I'm going to start my little demo here. 
And I want to be able to sort of demo both ends of this, both producer and consumer. So, uh, for, for, but I will always have one end being dialogue and then the other end being sort of not dialogue. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just load up some, some data. Um, and, and this setup thing is just dropping my, my, my containers and bringing them back up again um, and deleting a few, uh, a few, a few files. But, so I was casting around for some, some, some good data set um, to, to use for, for, for a demo. And Transport for London, they, they publish a live data feed of these Boris bikes. I don't know whether you're familiar with them, um, but it's a sort of bike rental scheme um, where you, you, you take a bike out of some sort of docking station and then you put it back when you're done and you get charged for the, for the time. Um, and there's a, there's a feed for these and it comes out as a, as a complicated XML thing, about 850 records, it's refreshed every, every minute. So what I was gonna do is I'm gonna pick this data feed up I'm going to do some tidying up of the data, converting it to JSON, a bit easier to deal with, and I'm going to push those JSON records onto uh, this Kafka topic called bikes. Um, and I'm going to run something like this. It doesn't matter so much exactly um, how it hangs together, but curl is, is a sort of command line uh, HTTP client that can fetch. Uh, it's a bit like HTTP command, I guess it can fetch uh, uh, URLs and, and the files. I'm going to feed this through something called XQ which is a streaming XML to JSON uh, uh, converter. And then finally, I'm going to push it to KCAT again, this time in producer mode, so that every record that comes in gets, gets sort of converted to, to JSON and put onto this, this topic. And I'm going to run this in my shell. Um, and I got, I've just got a little shortcut for, for this. Yeah. So that's pretty quick. Um, now they should live in, in my Kafka somewhere, somewhere is, is, is the idea. Um, so inside dialog, I'm going to create a consumer and then the zero here for a string. Um, and I think it's about 850 or so, at least last time I looked. I'm going to you know, pick the first 100, sort of just read those, that's in a, in, a, in a loop. And I'm going to store those in this vector called R. Um, and then I'm going to look at the first one. That certainly looks like something JSON-like. Um, we can check this. We can pass the first one using quad JSON, and then we dot into it. So that River Street, Clark and Well, that, that seems to be on the, on the first one there. So that, that that seems to have worked. So what about the other end, uh, the other direction? Yeah. So, so we just showed that we can pick up messages produced by something else. Let's produce something, uh, and and I have a bunch of namespaces. Um, which represents an, an, I don't know, an HR database of, of, uh, of people. Um, so I'm going to convert that to, um, to JSON, push it onto a topic, and on the outside, I'm going to pick these up and I'm going to store it in a relational database uh, as a sort of example of, of things, typical things that you might want to do with, with Kafka. So here's a little bit of the data, um, the first three records that I have. So I've got the, some sort of department code a uh, user ID and, and, and some names randomly gener generated. So let's make a string producer. Again, same drill um, with a zero. And I'm going to publish this again in a little uh, each, each thing there, converting each to JSON, pushing them onto the user's topic. Um, and now then, let's, let's look at uh, from, from the outside. And, and I'm going to do this bit of command line magic again. Uh, I'm going to use KCAT with a C for consumer mode, um, starting from the beginning. And when I get to the end, that's this minus E there means you get to the end, just sort of drop out. And I'm going to feeding, feeding it through the JQ uh, streaming JSON parser to convert each into a SQL statement that I'm then going to push to the SQLite uh, relational database. Uh, and here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, there it is. So we get the message from KCAT that it reached 100. We only had 100 in there, and then it exited. So now if I do... Oh, that's a different better, maybe I didn't run. Select star from um, 
employees order by name. Yeah, so well, it's only twice. Um, so I got everything now from from Aiden to Zachary uh, as as my users now. So to wrap this up, then, so I talked a little bit about Kafka, your data backbone to be perhaps fast, scalable, robust, durable, supported everywhere. If you can speak to Kafka, you can speak to anything else that, that, that can speak to it. So it's a bit of a force multiplier for, for cloud applications, I think. And if you can get dialogue to do to, to, to talk to to Kafka, you know, we can talk to databases, enterprise buses, everything really has has Kafka connectors nowadays. Um, and I showed you a little bit um, how we can talk to Kafka using using the .NET library, even though you had to jump through uh, jump through one of the couple of hoops uh, to to avoid the, uh, the the generics issue. So that was all I had to say. So if I, if there's some time left and, and if there are any uh, questions, I'm happy to take those now. Thank you. <laughs>